Hi everyone. As you can see from the paintings behind me, I usually work on a relatively large scale. But for this video presentation, I decided to create a tiny watercolor painting that measures two and a half inches high by three and a half inches long. This puts it within the category of baseball size cards. And I had so much fun painting this tiny painting that I decided to do an entire series of miniature watercolor paintings. Let's take a closer look at the painting. This is the actual watercolor painting that I made while recording the video. It's a tiny little thing. And watercolor miniatures are a wonderful way to develop one's watercolor painting skills. They enable you to practice watercolor painting techniques without making major commitment in time. Not only do I often begin the day by doing a few small watercolor paintings, but I often start my workshop classes by having my students create one or two small watercolor paintings. I find this warms students up and gets their artistic energies flowing. And often during long painting sessions, I'll give students a break from their more extended pieces by having them do a few quick watercolor sketches. I always like to paint a border around my tiny watercolor paintings. I like the way it frames them. So I begin my miniature watercolor painting by drawing it in. I have a technical pen. I like using a technical pen. And it has a number 2B lead in it. I need an eraser on hand in case I need to make corrections. And we're ready to go. I'll have the lotus flower over here. And the lily pad is going to come up over here. First I map out my subject without any any detail. This will guarantee that I can place everything on the paper. Lotus flowers are, are really beautiful. I guess all flowers are beautiful. But I have a particular fondness for lotus flowers. I've painted them quite often in my large canvases. Maybe it's because I love Monet's work, Claude Monet. You can go to the uh, Modern in New York City and see a wonderful triptych of his water lilies that he did late in life. Highly recommend it. The drawing is fine now. And what I always do with my watercolors is I lighten up the line with my needed eraser. Fantastic erasers. And that's why it's called kneaded. You mush it, get rid of the graphite or charcoal, whatever you're working with, and then go back in with a clean area. So I'll often start with the center. Now I, I see two colors. I see a Windsor yellow medium. I'm going to use that right here. I'll start working in little doodads dancing around like that. And then while that's wet, I'm going to go to some alizarin crimson. Begin to work that in. And I think of these brush marks as the creation of little canals of water that's going to transport color around and up into each other. So the color is going to intermingle. But see how I do it? With the tip of my brush. Quinacridone red, a much more intense red. And I do see it in the center of the flower, so why not get it in there? Beautiful. Okay. There we go. I'm going to allow that to dry before I paint in any petals that come in contact with that. But there's no reason why I can't dance around the surface now. And the way I, I do it is I'll wet an area where I intend to paint the flow. Then I study the colors that I, I want to achieve in the area. And I see it's some of that very strong quinacridone red. And it actually mingles in the petal with a little blue. I'm going to try a little cerulean blue. I'm happy with that. 
Watch the way I allow the color to do its own thing. A petal over here that is not touching anything. Let me dampen it. It's that strong red. It's sort of synthetic looking, but flowers often have colors that are very synthetic looking. A natural way for me to paint is always modulate within two or three variations of a color. And I always work wet into wet. But this is a tiny painting. It's two and a half by three and a half. Okay, I have the color for my background petal. Flowing a little of that color. Towards the base, I'm adding the quinacridone red. Okay. So this area here is much lighter than the inside of the petal. It's almost white. And when you're using the transparent watercolor technique, white is established by leaving the white of the paper. Okay, it has a strong shift to the violet there. So I'm using my permanent magenta mixed with cobalt blue. Lightens up. I'm going to lift a little out. And a little of that brilliant quinacridone red right there. Good. Leave it. This one, too, is an extremely light petal. Very pinkish, actually. And flow in my light color. Now, for the lily pad, I will use a little cobalt blue mixed with Windsor yellow. I much prefer to mix my greens. They are much more naturalistic. The first thing I'm going to do, having dampened it, is wash it over with my lightest value of green and let it dry. Once you let your watercolor dry, having established the first layer, you can work into it with additional colors. And as long as you don't go crazy with brushing, you won't be lifting up. The underneath color. Why is that? Because the gum arabic, that is the binder in watercolor. What is watercolor? It's, uh, it's pigment, which is the coloring agent. It's a little water. It's a little glycerin to slow up the drying rate. And it's gum arabic. Gum arabic is what binds the watercolor to the paper. If there was no gum arabic added to watercolor paint. It would be very powdery when dry and most of the color would just blow off the paper. And pull it towards the lighter value with a clean brush and plain water. Good. I could get a darker tone in there. Dampen it. And lay it in. Whenever I want to create a shade, I dampen the paper in that area and then work in my shade. It'll bleed into the other color very nicely. A 
lay in my foundation color first. I'm going to begin to add some of the veins that I see. So, how do I do that? These veins are barely visible and they're very blurry. So, I dampen the paper. Then, when I'm sure the moisture content is right, it has a slight matte look to it. With a fairly dry brush, I draw in the vein. It'll bleed in a way that I like. I'm not going to mess with it and try to improve on it. I let the accidents happen. Mix the green by adding a little bit more cobalt blue to that color. And now down here, flow it in. I want to push it around with a little bit more yellow. This petal works into a, a shadow, a blue shadow, so I'm going to dampen it. Hmm, I see some interesting colors going on here. A very subtle brown matter hint right there. Let me do the shadow first, then I'll show you how to do the little subtle brown matter that I see. I'm going to wash in some ultramarine blue. Pull it out into the dampened area. Beautiful. Leave it alone. I could also accentuate some of the shadow down here. And it's getting time to add the water. That'll do amazing things to the lily pad. It'll really pop it up. Ultramarine blue is a wonderful shadow color. Notice I'm not going with a gray. I don't have to. Why? Because I already have a good amount of primaries down. And the combination of the blue on top of the existing primaries, the reds and the yellows, will effectively gray the blue. And this is where you can go on and on with your subtleties, applying thin veils of color on top of dry color areas to enrich the subtle modulations of tone. See what's happening? That is becoming a shadow. I think what I'd like to do actually is lay in the water before I continue with anything else. This way the petals down here will begin to make sense and we'll have a more complete image to look at. So I'll dampen all the white areas that are going to become the water. Having dampened my entire background, now I'm going to begin to work in my water. Starting with a cobalt blue wash down here. Into the cobalt blue, some French ultramarine blue. And I would like to get either a little Payne's gray or neutral tint into that. So let's squeeze out. I have neutral tint here, so why not? Oh, yeah, I like doing that in my watercolors. 
often getting really dark accents of color, especially in the water area. It's very dark in the photo, so let's carry that up. And into this area, you see some submerged browns looking to me like beautiful burnt siennas. And this is where the burnt sienna might be the rhizomes that form the substructure for the lily pads. Massive root systems that spread all over the bottom of ponds. Fascinating to look at. I like it. You even see what must be a brown rhizome, greenish brown, up here. How about a little cerulean? Because I do see hints of it in my photo. Very subtle, but it's there. Hmm. Okay. Interesting. Some little green things in the water. The water does take on a, a quite a strong hint of red in areas, so I'm going to throw that down there and there. Maybe even in here. Got to be careful. You don't want to go too crazy. Oh, what did I use for the red? Alizarin Crimson. I do want to splatter it a little with water. There's all kinds of things going on in that water surface. I dampened that area there, and I'm going to flow in a little of the cobalt blue that's mixed with aureole and yellow. To create a more definite edge line for the lily pad. Before I mention that there was an indication of brown matter in this area, here's what I'm going to do. I want the most delicately thin line of brown. How do I do it? We dampen that petal. Now I'm going to flow in brown. So I said delicate. What am I doing? That doesn't look delicate. Well, the next step will do it. We push the brown with water. I actually like what's going on down there. Then with a damp brush, I wipe the brush off. And I literally suck up that paint. Add some more clean water. See what's happening? Suck it up again. Because the watercolor underneath is thoroughly dry, the gum arabic is locked in now. It's crystallized or it's done whatever it does. And I won't lift up the color underneath. That's why I'm able to do that. Okay, I'm going to allow that to dry. And I'd like to do the same thing on this one. So, I dampen it first. If you don't dampen it first with this technique, the paint will get right into the paper, and uh, that's it. You're not going to achieve this beautiful effect. Okay. Look at that.
Next, I need to, to work in some of the shadows or reflections. I think they're a combination of both shadow and reflection. And there's one over here that comes down and then changes its position because it's responding to the lily pad. Now, for the shadow color, I'm going to use cobalt blue. Ooh, I should have dampened the area first. I want to avoid anything that resembles a brush stroke. I'm going to also pick up a little magenta down there. I have to let that dry before I can do anything else. There's a whole series of shadows that, that'll fall here, but I want to handle each one individually and allow it to dry because I want to capture the distinction between them. I don't want them to merge into one big flat color area. Using cobalt blue, I want to capture the shadow that I see coming out here. Working in a little ultramarine and a little magenta. Good. It's a very delicate series of veins that fall on this one, and I'm gonna I want to capture them. I'm washing in the vein area. Then I'll lift out the color. I drew that in and then I changed its position because it's responding to the lily pad. Now I'm going to put my cobalt blue wash down there in the lines of my drawing to indicate that the shadow continues. Pretty strong shadow on the lily pad itself. Okay, I drew it. The shadow's gonna go up onto the pad, then onto the petal of the flower. Then I'm gonna flow my shadow color. And then when that's dry, I can continue with this. As I work in the shadows, I think, it's not in the photo, but I think a little bead of water coming down on the lily pad right here would be good. Now with my cobalt blue, I'm going to wash into that. And then pull it out with clean water. I didn't like the way this area was developing, so I decided to carry up the effect of water into this area of the lily pad. Now, to create the water effect, I'm going to scratch highlights into this area with my X-Acto knife. See? I'm getting the lip of the water. The water also continues up here. I was having a lot of fun with bringing out the highlights using my razor blade. 
and I finished it before I realized I wasn't filming. So let's put another water droplet right in this area over here. Since it's on a green lily pad, I'll use green as my foundation color. Okay, I'm making that a big droplet apparently. Flow in plain water. You ever notice how water droplets magnify and amplify colors? So, with that in mind, I'll add a little yellow into this. Okay. We have a water droplet there. Why not a series? How about if I establish another one over here? Now, I'm going to begin to work in highlights. Everything I do is based on observation. Highlights are important. Also, water droplets often have shadows. We'll dampen the area. Starting in the lower right with a little neutral tint. I think very carefully about the colors that I use for the border because I want them to complement and frame the painting in an effective way. I think I'm going to go back to my, my gray. The last thing to do after the border dried was to sign it with a rapidograph pen. I use the rapidograph because it comes with an extremely fine tip that enables me to write a small signature appropriate for such a tiny little painting. Well, the painting is finished. It's the first one I plan as an extended series of video demonstrations devoted to tiny baseball card size watercolor paintings. The painting measures two and a half inches high by three and a half inches long. I hope you enjoyed watching the video.